Okay, welcome to the first lecture about what's called the High Renaissance by our historians. And I think when you think about what that means, the High Renaissance, um, don't necessarily make the conclusion that it's better. Um, a lot of times art historians like to have opinions about things, and sometimes those opinions become standard opinions. But I don't necessarily share those standard opinions. So in this section, when we talk about the High Renaissance, we're basically going to talk about three artists. Um, Leonardo, uh, who we'll talk about first, uh, Michelangelo, and Raphael. And other artists are important during this time, but we can get everything we need as far as the changes that are happening to influence what's going to happen later by talking about these three artists. And I should mention right off the bat, with Leonardo da Vinci, uh, no art historians call him da Vinci because that would be very weird. <laughs> All that Leonardo da Vinci means is he didn't have a last name. Uh, he was from the Italian city of, of Vinci, so it just means Leonardo from Vinci. Uh, so that would be like people saying to me, um, from Detroit, and that was my name. Doesn't really make any sense, does it? So anyway, um, so he lives from 1452 to 1519. He's a lot older than some of the other artists, than the other two artists we're going to look at. Um, he was trained by Andrea del Verrocchio, who we looked at earlier um, with the statue of the Doubting St. Thomas. And usually when people use the phrase Renaissance man, Leonardo is kind of the guy that they're thinking of. Um, and all of that means, and you can be a Renaissance person too, um, although this culture was very male dominated, I should say, um, is that you just study everything. Uh, and it's not really something that people can usually do nowadays, although art historians have to do a lot of it um, because so many things are specialized. Uh, but it was something that developed through the medieval era uh, and was the sign of a cultured person that they had a lot of knowledge. And this idea of what it takes to be a culture person makes it into higher education. That's why you take liberal arts classes like this one, um, even if you're taking science or something like that. So he was interested in a lot of things, botany, geology, geography, cartography, zoology, military engineering, animal lore, anatomy, and physical science. Um, some of his studies of motion in the natural world and of an anatomy um, were extremely influential and far ahead of their time. Uh, and in some ways, um, even though he's an extremely influential artist, it was a pretty small bit of what he was doing with his life. Uh, so he started in Florence, uh, and that's where all of this stuff is starting in general. And then he eventually moves to Milan, and he didn't really look at himself as an artist first. So just to give you an example, uh, he basically would say this to people. He said, um, this was a, a letter to someone, kind of like a cover letter you do for a job. He said, and in short, according to a variety of cases, I can contrive various and endless means of offense and defense in time of peace. I believe I can give perfect satisfaction and equal of any other in architecture and the composition of buildings, public and private, and in guiding water from one place to another. I can carry out sculpture and marble, bronze, or clay, and also I can do painting, whatever may be done, as well as any other be he whom he may, uh, which is true, but you'll notice that painting was the last thing he mentioned. And um, as far as we know, we don't have any sculptures left from him, uh, but he was very influential in painting. And certainly some of the ways that he observed things like a scientist uh, were really useful in becoming a good painter. So one thing that you'll kind of want to keep in mind throughout this section, and it'll come up over and over again, especially when we talk about Raphael, is that the big difference that's going on with the high Renaissance is we looked at the early Renaissance, and we have one style that was very mathematical and trying to create these incredibly rational spaces. And then we had another style that was a little bit more like mystical, spiritual, um, thinking more about transcendence and about beautiful things. Uh, the artists during this time, they're definitely going to have lots of down-to-earth stuff and scientific things, but they're also going to try to balance it out um, with those more uh, kind of mystical styles as well. So he was in Milan for 20 years. He actually ended up dying in Paris, which is why the Mona Lisa is there. 
So this is one of his very early paintings. Um, it's 1485. Uh, and there's only about eight, nine, or 10, depending on how you look at it, surviving paintings of his, and a couple of unfinished ones and tons of drawings. Uh, but in those surviving paintings, um, he was extremely influential. Uh, so this one is an oil on panel. And in this class, I'm not going to talk about the Dutch Renaissance, uh, but the Dutch were the ones that developed um, oil painting. And although it doesn't catch on as the medium quite yet, um, over the next hundred years that we're going to study from 1500 to 1600, it will be the medium. And if you're a painter, you'll, can, you'll do oil on canvas. Um, so this was an oil on panel and it was transferred to canvas, but it's the same idea. And you can see it's a pretty big one, <laughs> six feet high. So it's the central panel of an altarpiece for the co-fraternity of the Immaculate Conception in San Francisco, Francesco Grande. Uh, and that's kind of important because it's contributing to that cult of Mary that we were talking about before. Uh, and this particular co-fraternity, they like this idea. They have Immaculate Conception right in the name. So they, they want to um, raise up Mary and they picked a perfect artist to do it. So a couple of things that he does differently than other artists before this, you may have noticed that the high Renaissance art that we looked at, it was pretty um, realistic, but there were things that were missing. Um, and a lot of artists were kind of recognizing at the time, and that was basically air. Um, so whenever you look at things, you're looking through air. Uh, and when you look at the edges of things, the edges aren't so hard. Um, they kind of soften at the edges. And if it's like a cloudy day, things seem even softer, or a misty day, or a foggy day, even softer still. So um, one of the techniques, which is very difficult to do and to explain, um, that Leonardo used uh, to achieve this effect uh, was called an Italian sfumato, and that just means smoky. Um, and the other thing he's using, which sfumato is basically a part of it, is chiaroscuro. And that just refers to light and dark. Um, so by using um, lights and darks, uh, you can kind of like mold the figures. And Leonardo was more fond of using deeper shadows and lights and darks within the figures themselves um, and more dramatic light to kind of make things look a little bit more natural. So in the early Renaissance, we have these really mathematical spaces and the bodies look pretty natural, but Leonardo's moving a next step by using these techniques. And, and you can really tell <clears throat> there's two versions of this painting and pretty much everyone thinks that this one at the Louvre is Leonardo and this one isn't. And you can kind of see the differences. Um, the faces are very similar uh, and we have a lot of clarity in this one but it's missing some of the chiaroscuro. There's darkness and lightness, but there isn't this like kind of subtle transition between the dark and light. And there isn't much in the way of sfumato. So in other words, you don't get this like kind of smoky effect that softens up the edges, which represents more how we see things in real life. Um, so in a way, this one feels more like it's part of the natural world, like we're looking into a window of another world whereas this one um, is a little too sharp. So his assistants, you know, maybe whoever um, commissioned the painting liked this style better. Sometimes students like this, the one on the right better, but uh, this is, everyone pretty much thinks this is the Leonardo. When you get in close, uh, you can see that one of the figures is pointing to Jesus. Uh, and that's the pointing that we had seen before. Uh, and then we see Mary, and she's kind of holding her hand um, over the earth in a way. Uh, and it's almost like she's a mother goddess here. Um, and in a way she is, because she gives birth to a god, and Christians believe that that god um, en enabled them to have salvation. Uh, so Leonardo's kind of playing with that idea a little bit by putting her hand over the earth, uh, and then showing her um, with all of these plants all around, just like we saw Botticelli doing with, um, with the spring goddess. So same sorts of ideas going on. <clears throat> so 
So something really cool will happen in the West uh, that had happened in other places in the world a long time ago, but enabled artists to be able to um, kind of practice a little more and experiment a little more. Uh, and that was when paper became inexpensive. Uh, before this time in the West, not in other places like China, uh, paper was hard to get. Um, so that meant that how are you going to practice? You're going to you know, practice on boards or something like that. Um, with the advent of paper, artists were able to experiment a lot more, try things out that may or may not work, um, do preliminary drawings for compositions, uh, and do amazing things like this. Sometimes art historians will look at this, which is a drawing, and say this is the first high renaissance um, two-dimensional work of art. And again, like saying high renaissance is, uh, you know, isn't like really a judgment call, but it kind of shows that balance that I was talking about between the rational um, and the more spiritual. Uh, and this painting in a way is, uh, or this drawing is the first one to do that. So to kind of bring all those ideas together. So this is called Cartoon for the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and Infant St. John. It's basically the same subject we saw before. Uh, we have Jesus and Mary um, and Anne, who's Mary's cousin, um, and John, who is Jesus's cousin, uh, and he's John the Baptist. Sometimes they show him wearing like a cloak or something that shows he's going to grow up to be John the Baptist. You can see little baby Jesus is blessing John, and then um, Anne is kind of holding her hand up to heaven, showing like where Jesus comes from, more or less. Uh, so one of the things that Leonardo himself thought was really important was that the composition of a picture should tell a story um, and it should also um, have feeling. So, and we've already seen some people doing that with telling a story and um, not as much with feeling, but we'll see more of that in a moment. Uh, so diseño, uh, which means composition, uh, diseño externo, which means external physical manifestation, um, and then diseño interno, internal intellectual idea. So the idea is you arrange your figures in such a way that you can see the ideas that or feelings that are within, or within them or the ideas that you're trying to um, put out there. So we already have some of the ideas with the way that the hands are arranged that I explained before and the way the figures are arranged. And Leonardo starts to kind of like put the figures on this really solid base. You can see how it makes a pyramid. Uh, one of the things that happens compared to the medieval era, era is they try to bring religion down to earth. Uh, and by literally making the figures have the solid base, uh, it has this effect of bringing religion down to earth. And when we talk about the Baroque later in Caravaggio, he's really going to bring it down to earth. So this is um, his second most famous painting. <laughs> uh, and there was like an unfortunate book about it that, that you may have heard of um, that, that had a lot of ideas in it that aren't true. Uh, so I'll kind of explain what those ideas are a little bit later. Um, and I'll explain why it's not true. Um, but it really gives you that idea of the external um, communicates the internal or the ideas. Um, so we see both of that going on here. Um, when you when this picture first comes up, what's the first thing you want to look at? It's almost like your eyes are forced to do it. Is Jesus. And part of the reason why is because when we looked at um, linear perspective, we saw that there's these lines that meet at a vanishing point. And all of those lines, we can, you can trace here, they meet at a vanishing point right behind Jesus. He's in the center, so we want to look at him, and there's a little bit of space between him and the 12 apostles. So this one's about the Last Supper, and <laughs> um, those of you who are Italian-American have already seen <laughs> this so many times, because I'm certain that your grandmother or great-grandmother has one of these on her wall, because they all do. Uh, a nicer, a kind of like redone version, not this exact one. Uh, but this is about the Last Supper. So this is the last meal that Jesus had with his closest followers. Um, he knew that the next day he was going to be arrested and 
you know, well, he's going to be arrested that night and he was going to be executed the next morning. Uh, so this is his kind of send off uh, to his closest followers. And he says to them, uh, you know, let's have some bread uh, and we break bread. Uh, he says that when he breaks the bread, he says things that probably sounded kind of weird at the time. He says, this is my body. Uh, and then he pours some wine and he says, this is my blood. Uh, nowadays, people that are Catholic, uh, they believe that literally, um, they believe that the bread and the wine was made into the flesh and the blood of Christ. And in their ceremony called communion, uh, they believe that a priest transforms these things um, into the flesh and blood of Christ. And that goes along with that idea of Jesus sacrificing his body um, to have the salvation of, of others. So then he says, one of you is about to betray me. Uh, and that is the moment that we're seeing the painting being made. Uh, and everyone's saying, is it I? Is it I? And you can see them, they're kind of discussing each other and saying, could be me, you know, I didn't do this. You know, um, I wouldn't do that to you, JC, bro. Like, we're cool. Um, and everyone's like that. <clears throat> and then he says, it was one of the 12, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. Uh, so you can see that he's reaching very dramatically with his hand uh, for some bread. And there's another figure who is doing precisely the same thing. And that figure is Judas. And I'll talk about how that figure is different, uh, but he's different in the same way that we saw with Giotto and other artists. It's a pretty anti-Semitic um, depiction. So <laughs> probably already noticing something that's kind of weird about this painting. Seems like part of it's missing. Uh, and that's because it's a wall painting uh, and it was painted at a perfect spot. Uh, it's in a monastery and this is uh, the dining hall where all the monks eat. And um, it was painted on the wall above the doorway. And then later on, people are like, uh, we're going to make the doorway bigger. And they just cut off Jesus's feet. Some people say maybe they thought like seeing Jesus's feet wasn't the best idea, but I highly doubt that because... Jesus is all about feet <laughs> in the Bible. Uh, he has stories about washing feet to show that he's humble and he's human. So as you can see, he already creates this kind of um, scene with the way that people are opposed. And we can look at them um, one by one and kind of see it like this guy, he's putting his hands up. He's like, no, it couldn't be me. Other people are leaning in. Um, this guy who's Peter is kind of tapping the shoulder of John. He's pictured right here. Uh, like whispering in his ear, like, no, it's, who is it? it's not me. And then someone else is pointing upwards and saying, I swear. And then this guy just throwing his hands out. Um, and then he's just pleading. It's like, couldn't be me. Like, you're the best. Uh, and then these guys are just kind of discussing it. Um, and he groups them in three so we can get these like little uh, scenes or vignettes of what's going on. And Jesus just sits here like a pyramid again, right in the center. Um, so he's getting that diseño eterno and it's telling that story that's on the inside. So these are the particular figures. If you want to take a look at them, this isn't something you have to memorize. Um, but Leonardo says uh, a, hold on, I'm going to move my, So hold on a sec. A good painter has two chief objects to paint, man and the intention of the soul. The former is easy, the latter hard, for it must be expressed in gestures and the movement of limbs. And he's, notice he's saying movement and something that stopped, but we already felt movement by looking at the way that people are arranging their hands uh, and by the fact we have these like four little groups, so we're moving our eyes as we go along. Uh, it's like the story is progressing. So unfortunately, this painting was painted in kind of experimental way. Uh, usually when you paint on a wall, you use this technique called blanc fresco, 
which have been tested for literally thousands of years and worked really well. And Leonardo was like, oh, I don't know, I'll try something different. Uh, it didn't work out, so the painting started to crack immediately. They tried to save what they could, but you know, there's not a, a whole lot left uh, as far as what we see. But he has a drawing, so we can really get some of the details that way, and we'll take a look. Um, so unfortunately, some of the things missing, but you can see how people are pleading. Another little vignette here, telling the story. What? Who is it? Like him? I don't know. Like I wouldn't do it. Uh, and then hands off, and just like people are getting kind of close. Everyone's wondering what's going on. It's a big drama. So um, there was a book that was made into a movie, uh, which could have been good, but for some reason wasn't. Uh, called the Da Vinci Code. Uh, written by Dan Brown and was kind of weird because it has a bunch of like kind of conspiracy theory type stuff which is kind of silly if you think about it um, and for some reason Dan Brown was like oh yeah some of this is true which doesn't really make any sense because it doesn't need to be true for it to be an entertaining story um, but one of the things that he said was that in this painting <laughs> the Leonardo actually wanted to show um, that this was Mary Magdalene who he was dating and not John. And that's just totally false. Uh, and you people that are ignorant of art history might think that because this is a super feminine figure. But there's a couple of things going on here. Um, first off, uh, Leonardo is gay. Uh, and we that's the way people would identify themselves nowadays. Back then, he wouldn't really say anything. Um, it wasn't, it was actually illegal in Florence to be gay. Um, but, you know, a lot of these artists were that way and a lot of other people. So um, unless you had enemies, um, you could usually get away with it. So you kind of understand having like a special love for another man. And oftentimes when he pictured John, he pictured it like one of his young boyfriends. Um, so we have drawings of those and you can kind of see uh, the relationship. And part of the reason why people see it this way, it doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. It could be just, this is like a beautiful, younger, kind of innocent man. Like, so you just have a, like a soft spot in your heart for him. Um, and it says in the book of John, who is traditionally written by this, that John is identified as the disciple whom Jesus, Jesus loved. So someone that has like a special place in his heart. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter, that's him right there. Uh, mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple leaning back against Jesus said to him, Lord, who is it? So it's not Mary Magdalene. It's like straight from the story. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's exactly how they would do it. Uh, and just in case you don't believe me, uh, kind of showing John as um, a teenager or kind of um, more feminine um, is common. Uh, and that's the way they do it. Sometimes they have in the Last Supper, where John is just like kind of leaning into the lap of Jesus. Uh, so there's no conspiracy or anything like that. It's just the way people did things at the time to kind of illustrate that John was younger, more innocent, more special to Jesus uh, or something like that. So it is interesting though, the relationship with femininity and John because John was the only of Jesus's male followers that didn't abandon him. Uh, so when you see pictures of the crucifixion, you only see one man, and that's John. Uh, and then you see all of his female followers, Jesus's female followers, stuck with him. Um, so there is that kind of relationship, uh, which also might explain why they make him look kind of feminine. So as far as Judas, we see um, this idea, and it's really clearly illustrated right here, um, an idea that developed uh, through more and more into the 19th century, this idea, and I'm putting out the air quotes, the Jews killed Jesus, uh, which is kind of ridiculous in a way since everybody in those stories is Jewish uh, except for the Roman governor. Um, so yeah, there were Jewish people that arrested him uh, and um, they didn't give the order of execution, but they were certainly happy with the result. But Jesus is Jewish and all of his followers are Jewish and everybody is a Palestinian Jew uh, in ancient Palestine. So um, 
to show Judas as this is is just like a way to kind of apply a more modern anti-Semitism um, to this Christian story. And it follows that they show, like for instance, you can see Simon Peter, he has a very long straight nose, what people call it a Roman nose. Most Italians don't have this, but you know, it's just a, it's, it's called a Roman nose because uh, some, Julius Caesar had it. And then we see Judas as having a hook nose uh, and swarthier skin, so darker skin. And you can see the model being used right here. This is actually a pretty typical Italian face, but um, that's not what Leonardo is going for. He's going for showing Judas as the, um, the kind of Jewish character. Uh, so unfortunately, this sort of anti-Semitism makes its way into all of these paintings and it becomes basically a convention. Uh, so this is his most famous painting and maybe the most famous painting in the world. Um, maybe for next week, I should do an in-class assignment or something where we try to figure out if this is the, why this is the most famous painting in the world. There's actually some reasons for that. Uh, but it's a pretty cool painting. Um, and, you know, there isn't really a mystery of who's in it. Uh, we know it is. It's Lisa D'Antonio, Maria Garadini, wife of Francesco del Giacondo. So sometimes she's called La Giaconda, um, just meaning the wife of, um, of this dude. Um, and he's a rich guy, uh, and he had a young wife, and he went to Leonardo and said, painter. And Leonardo was like, sure. And then he took forever to finish it and then never gave it to him and just like dragged her around himself <laughs> with himself the whole time. Uh, it may have been that some of his assistants did a copy of this painting uh, and actually gave it to, uh, to Francesco, but you know, we don't really know. There are, there are a bunch of copies of this that were made at the time because people thought it was really cool. Um, so there's a couple of things that are going on with the Mona Lisa. Um, First off, we can see a lot of that sfumato that I was talking about before. The painting's kind of dirty, um, and the colors aren't like what they were, uh, but there is that smokiness that we see around the edges. Parts of the painting are also cut off because uh, they were transferred a couple of times to different panels. The current panel is in really bad shape. Uh, if you ever go to Louvre or if you have been there, you know that you can't really get close to it, and it's behind glass. It's way better to see it. <laughs> this way uh, on a big screen. You can get a lot more detail than you can any other way. So he's got those fumato, so these soft edges uh, and chiaroscuro, um, some lights to darks so and not a hard edge with that either. You know, kind of a soft transition. Lots of shadows going in her face, which is part of the reason that a lot of modern people look at it and they're like, what's going on? Uh, you can kind of ask yourself, is she smiling? Is she smirking? Is she like frowning? Because of the way that he uses the shadows, um, we can't really tell. It seems to have many different faces at once. The way she's posed, uh, and then the way the painting was originally done, it would have had a couple of pillars here. So it'd be clear that she was sitting kind of um, near a window. Uh, this came from Dutch painting. Uh, and Leonardo was a big fan of Dutch painting. We already saw they use oil and he's using oil again here. Um, so that pose of some Dutch painting, usually during this time, uh, Italian elites would have themselves shown in profile. Uh, she's shown a three quarters view and he made this with this painting, basically the acceptable way, uh, for portraiture to work. So we're going to see a million portraits like this. Uh, and there's some things that are going on that we saw in the Virgin of the Rocks earlier. The background that he picks, it's got lots of water, it's got lots of plants, um, there's lots of things going on. Uh, so he's making her this like matronly-like figure and um, this guy, Francesco, he wants to marry someone that can produce him some kids so he can put on that family business to the children. So you put those types of things into the painting but he never gave it to him. <laughs> so uh, he really liked this painting and he just dragged it around with him the rest of his life. So this is a um, color correction of what it probably looked like uh, whenever it was originally made. Um, and I have this and I'm not gonna open it right now because I'm not sure if it'll crash my computer, but I'll put that in the description of this video. It's an ultra high resolution Mona Lisa 
huge. When I mean ultra high, I mean ultra high, you'll see. Uh, and it's <clears throat> a really good way to see it. So with this one, it's basically been color corrected to the way that closer to the way it would have originally looked. There probably would have been more blue here, uh, but it's basically just using some um, the scientific knowledge we have about the paintings and how it would have looked originally. So this isn't the way it looks now, but closer to the way it would have looked when it was first made. And this is a copy of La Giaconda um, underneath this painting. Uh, this black painting, uh, it was found that this was added later um, and it actually has like a background that's very similar. Um, so this is what it looks like now. And this painting has been at the Prado, uh, which is in Spain. And uh, they are claiming that it's a Leonardo painting. Uh, and everyone outside of the Prado thinks they're full of shit. Uh, and the reason why is kind of clear. Uh, we don't see that Leonardo Sumato. In this one. Um, we don't see the types of kind of softness and there's really there's pretty good shadows in this part uh, but it's not quite as as like harder hard to tell what's going on with her face whereas with this one it's pretty clear she's doing a little half smile or smirk or however you want to look at it. Really cool painting uh, but again nobody except for the Prado's art historians thinks this is real but it kind of shows it is old it was made around the same time. So it kind of shows that this might have been one of the copies that Leonardo's assistant made uh, to give to the dude who never got his painting. Um, or it could have been um, just made later for somebody else because the painting was really cool. Uh, and we can see the pillars, which would have originally been in this one. That's kind of like when the Prado, when they cleaned this off and saw the pillars, uh, they're like, yeah, maybe it's real because people didn't know about the pillars until recently. Um, so who knows? Um, now this one, the Isleworth Mona Lisa, these people have a little bit more solid ground to stand on, um, because this face, uh, is very, and this is in England, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, right, because the British like to pronounce things strangely. Uh, I put the link to this Mona Lisa Foundation, and they're trying to figure out, and there's still not a lot of agreement whether this is an actual um, Leonardo, perhaps, again, the one that he gave to uh, the commissioner, or maybe just another one he made where the face looked more like what he liked. As you can see, the face, facial shape is quite different. It's more like the earlier Leonardo's. Uh, maybe it was a first try, um, but it does have some smulato. Uh, it does have the original way that this painting um, was composed with the pillars, so we can it's clear that it's looking out the window. Uh, there's not a lot of background, so it almost looks like it's unfinished. So maybe this was a try and and Leonardo tossed it. It is from the right time period. Um, a lot of experts have looked at it and said this could be him, um, but unless we can get documentation, we can't really tell. People can copy really well. <laughs> So it could be a copy, this, but this one's definitely got more solid ground as far as stylistically that it could be a Leonardo as well. Um, so before I go on, a couple of things I wanted to say that are kind of strange about the painting um, is that Leonardo is showing the Mona Lisa in an unusual way to show women. Um, women at this time, especially elite women who are married to elite men, um, so when I say elite, I just mean wealthy, um, they would be of high status. They would not be expected to do anything. Um, 15th century, 16th century Italy was a very patriarchal culture. Uh, and it was even more so in some ways uh, for elite women um, because working class women uh, would have more power generally in their own um, kind of household uh, compared to elite women who were expected just to look pretty uh, and weren't even educated very well, uh, not say much, uh, and just sit there. Um, basically, look good and produce babies. Well, um, what's unusual is that Leonardo is showing her um, prominently with her hands displayed. And at this time, uh, if you would, it was kind of a convention, if you showed someone with their hands, 
uh, it showed that they do things with their hands. So if you wanted to show an artist or a sculptor or um, somebody who is, you know, an architect, something like that, somebody that does things to create things, um, they would show their hands. Uh, and it would show this person does something, you know, <laughs> other than just be rich. Uh, so it's kind of unusual that she's being shown in that way. The other thing is that women at this time are expected to be seen, but not to see. Um, and look what she's doing. She's looking right at us. Uh, and even after this time, it would be unusual to show women as looking straight into the viewer. Um, so in a way, Leonardo is showing women in... Um, at least this woman in a much more um, balanced way um, than what how she would be treated in real life. Uh, so some people might speculate that perhaps because Leonardo is gay and he kind of has that fear of being found out if an enemy wants to take him out or something like that, um, that he would have like a little bit of a hint of uh, how women at this time would feel that would be a really small hint because Leonardo was wealthy himself uh, and well-known, um, privileged as they would say today. Um, so maybe that's true, maybe not, but it is certainly an unusual way to show a woman in that time uh, in a very rigidly patriarchal culture. So his drawings are kind of amazing. Um, and this is uh, maybe a little gross, um, but um, some of these artists, um, Michelangelo and Leonardo, they did dissections. Uh, and that's standard practice um, if people are studying to be doctors. Um, they do dissections on bodies, uh, even if they're not going to be surgeons. Uh, and so you can kind of understand anatomy. Uh, but before this time, it was thought to be ghoulish. Uh, and it was also thought to be uh, against God to take a body uh, and cut it up. But... Um, you know, science kind of prevailed and curiosity prevailed and artists and other scientists realized they could learn a lot by cutting into the body uh, and learning more about anatomy um, because the anatomy books that were out there at that time weren't very good. Um, so this painting that shows um, a pregnant woman who died uh, during pregnancy, um, it's not very accurate in a modern sense, but it is an attempt uh, that's similar to how medical drawing was done in later times, uh, where you kind of show this view and it's like you open it up and you see what's in the inside. And it's sometimes called an exploded view. Basically, the idea is this is what it looks like on the inside and, and it's taking you through that. Uh, so the accuracy isn't what would you have today, um, but pretty close, um, much more accurate than anybody had done before. So some of these are kind of incredible in the accuracy that they have. Uh, so this one is very accurate. So in the interior of the body, and sometimes artists um, thought this was important. Like Leonardo was interested in it for scientific purposes, but we'll see Michelangelo, who's just an artist, was interested in it because he thought to understand he was creating sculptures, especially to understand the body, we have to understand what's underneath it, um, which is true. You kind of have to understand the muscles and everything. Uh, so this is an amazing kind of picture right there. Um, he's mostly selling himself as an engineer to wealthy people. And he made all kinds of strange um, potential inventions. And we don't know, most of them, as far as we know, weren't attempted to be made. Uh, but there's this series called Doing Da Vinci. Uh, and I'll include a link if it's still there. It keeps getting taken down on YouTube. Uh, and you can see they actually try to create some of these things. Uh, so um, 16th century and 15th century Italy, uh, the reason why Italy became more powerful is because it became more militaristic. They were trying to control trade in the Mediterranean. Uh, so a lot of people that hired him, uh, they wanted guns, they wanted ramparts, they wanted other things that could help them to defeat people in battle. Uh, so this multiple barrel cannon and machine gun, not in a modern sense. Uh, was here. So in this video, they actually make this thing. <laughs> uh, it's pretty out there. Uh, so this is probably his most famous drawing. Um, it is referring to a couple of things. It's called the canon of human proportions. A canon means a standard, um, a set of standards, basically a list of standards. 
Uh, and sometimes it's called Vitruvian Man. Uh, it refers to an ancient Roman architect, Vitruvius, in his book three of the treatise De Architectura, who said um, there's these perfect proportions in nature and architecture should realize those proportions. Uh, so with this man, where he has a circle and a square, uh, he's showing his perfect proportions. And some people believe, like I've had other people say, like, yeah, your arm span is the same as your height. Uh, and that works um, for some people. It wouldn't work for me. Uh, you're not seeing me in person this semester, but my arms are much longer than my height. I'm 5'10", but my arms are 6'2". Uh, so this is more of a kind of an idealistic uh, proportions of a man. And the idea of having a circle over a square illustrate, illustrates that theme I was talking about it before of bringing um, the down the earth things together with the spiritual things. The circle represents um, the divine and the square represents down to earth things. A circle goes on forever and ever, it never ends. A square has corners and ends. And that reflects the way that Christians look at people. Uh, people have their bodies for a short period of time uh, but they believe that they go to heaven um, afterwards. Um, humans are also seen at this time to be kind of like the one creature that's different than the animals, uh, that it's like a um, partially divine figure uh, because we as humans have like a very clear consciousness that we can communicate to others. I'm not making comments right now, by the way, on whether or not uh, humans, yeah, other animals have consciousness or not. So he's trying to express those ideas through this man, um, through these proportions. You may have noticed already that the writing that he has here is backwards. Uh, you don't have to read Italian or Latin to be able to understand that it's backwards. Um, all this stuff is in Italian. And there's a lot of information on this slide, none of which you need to know. The only reason I'm listing it is to show how much math went into this drawing. It's not just a simple square and a circle. And you can see how he cuts up the pieces of the body uh, and he explains in this description how each part of the body is related to another uh, through um, proportions. Uh, so think of uh, having fractions, you know, it's basically that kind of idea. And each part of the body is related to other parts. And the ancient Greeks were fond of this uh, and they kind of thought it was a way to show human perfection. Uh, and that's what um, Leonardo is trying to do here as well. Um, so he's writing backwards. Um, some people say it's because he was concerned that people would pick up his books and steal his ideas, uh, you know, because he's basically an engineer. That's his main job. He doesn't want people to steal his ideas. It could be that. Um, it could be also that he's left-handed uh, and and any of you, I'm left-handed. So if you know, if you try to use ink, uh, sometimes it'll smudge as you're drawing uh, because uh, if you start the left and go to the right, it tends to smudge everything. Um, for left-handers, it's really easy for us to pick up writing backwards. So that may be a reason as well, just it prevents them from smudging things. So this would be a good time to pause because we'll talk about Michelangelo and his sculpture. Uh, and um, we'll talk about his painting in a later lecture, but you should pause right now, take a break, and then start it up, and um, I'll talk about uh, Michelangelo. So hopefully you got a break, and I got some tea, and I'm recording this in the evening, so <laughs> some peppermint tea. Uh, so we'll talk about Michelangelo, and like I said, I'll talk about his painting a little bit later on. Uh, so his full name, he actually has a last name, is Michelangelo Bonarati. It's more fun to say it with an Italian accent. Uh, he's quite a bit younger than Leonardo, but he lives a long time, as you can see, uh, getting more and more sick and honorary as he gets older. Uh, and that'll become more relevant when he'll get his paintings that he makes later in his life. But he always considered himself a sculptor first. Uh, he said that sculpture was superior to a painter um, because... It illustrates the divine power to make man. Uh, so in a way, this could be um, that connection that humans have that's special, it was believed at the time, um, to God or angels or whatnot um, to be able to create. Um, and there's, there's something to that, like humans are um, literally more creative than other animals. 
So the sculptor extricates the idea from the block. Uh, so he's using sculpture where he's carving. So he's starting with something and taking away uh, to create what we see. Uh, and sometimes he fails, uh, and that'll be that'll come up a little bit later on in this class, a few hundred years from now. The artist's inspired judgment could identify other pleasing proportions. So when you're working with stone, sometimes you have to let the stone um, define a little bit what's going on. Um, but also, uh, the idea with this is that instead of necessarily going for those perfect, and I'm putting up the air quotes, perfect. Uh, proportions that Leonardo did in the previous drawing we saw. Instead, you could modify the proportions to illustrate a story. And this is going to be very influential on other artists um, for the next few hundred years. So in some ways, uh, Michelangelo <laughs> is the most influential of the artists we're going to study during the High Renaissance. Um, so he had an apprentice to Gorlandio. Uh, but didn't finish the training. Uh, part of the reason why is uh, he wasn't exactly what you would call a pleasing dude, Michelangelo. <laughs> he didn't get along with people very well. But since he was so talented and so hardworking, um, people kind of accepted that. Uh, and that might be unfortunate because this is kind of one of the first examples of that artistic genius uh, giving people an excuse to be an asshole. Uh, which you don't necessarily want, uh, especially in men in a patriarchal culture. Uh, so he came to Rome uh, because that's where the money was. Uh, that's where the Pope was, and that's where he could get the big commissions. Uh, and you could get incredible stone like this marble, uh, which was very expensive. Um, this particular piece, uh, which is called Pieta, uh, which is, again, like a, not an Italian type of subject, uh, it was originally more of a German subject, and Michelangelo was one of the first to do it in Italy. It was commissioned by the French Cardinal Jean de Bilher La Grola. <laughs> That's a weird word to pronounce in French. Uh, for Old St. Peter's, uh, which was the old version of the um, St. Peter's um, church that was in Rome. Uh, Michelangelo himself actually designed the new version, which, which still stands there today. So the theme is from France and Germany. And as you can see, we have a French cardinal. Uh, cardinals are just these like kind of high ranking people in the church and they eventually pick the, the new Pope when the old Pope dies. A couple of things you may not notice that's weird about this picture. Um, the first thing is that Mary looks like a teenager. Um, and that would be weird because she has a 30 something year old son uh, laying dead in her lap. Uh, so some of the ideas on why she would be created in that way is to kind of show um, this idea that she's special among women. Um, it says that uh, in, in the Bible that she's kind of uh, revered among women um, and trying to show like a sort of innocence. So in patriarchal culture, often like virginality and youth will show like in, uh, innocence in women. Uh, so it may be why there's they're showing it that way. And Jesus looks pretty young himself. Uh, <laughs> and um, noticeably lacking, lacking in any body hair. Uh, apparently, uh, Jesus waxed before he, before he got up there on the cross, um, according to this picture. Um, but the other thing that's kind of strange about it is that Mary is huge. She looks delicate if you see her facial features, her neck and her hands. Uh, but her hips are giant um, and part of the reason why is because it creates that pyramidal structure that we saw uh, this is made around the same time as that drawing the cartoon that Leonardo made of Mary and Saint Anne um, so it could be influenced by that um, but it does create this very solid base and literally bring Christ's death down to earth although it looks like a pretty peaceful death considering how this person had been tortured um, and he was only, if you're doing some math here, when he was born, uh, he was only in his early 20s when this was created. I think it was, let's go back and see. Uh, so he was 23 when he started this. Uh, so um, very accomplished at this point already as a sculptor. And he was really showing off a bit. Um, part of the showing off was the way that he creates these incredible proportions that would normally seem um, kind of thick and 
he makes them delicate, um, but also these in, these folds that are throughout um, that he probably learned from his uh, mentor. Uh, so this one is just another version of it with the background taken out. Uh, and you can really see how Mary is very, very young looking. Um, and he does a bunch of challenging things in this picture. Besides the folds, <laughs> marble is a very hard stone. And there's a million times when he was doing this that it could have messed up and he'd have to throw away the whole stone and start over again. As you can see, it took two years. So it would be a maddening process. Um, a very youthful face, very peaceful face. Um, and it says on our sash across there, Michelangelo definitely wasn't humble. It says, uh, Michelangelo Bonarati Florentine made it. <laughs> uh, so he's signing it. And this wasn't a common thing for artists to do. And it's not a common thing for artists to do later. Um, it's not until the 20th century that we really see, in the 19th century, that we really see artists signing all their work. But this one, he wanted to show that what he could do at 23. Um, again, we see her face from another angle. Uh, very delicate, very youthful. This doesn't look like a 50-some-year-old woman. Uh, this looks like a very young woman. Um, so he's kind of illustrating this idea of innocence. Uh, and then when we look at Jesus, it looks like he just drifted off to sleep. Uh, later artists will be more interested in the violence. Uh, and the German theme usually had more violence and blood in it. Uh, but in this one, uh, he's doing more like what the ancient Greeks would do, uh, sometimes where they didn't want to show any pain or suffering, and it just looks like he drifted off to sleep. We get closer, we can see the details. He looks good. This, this seems like it was easy. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, we see it from another angle, uh, and he's showing him as kind of like a youthful man, like Leonardo would do for John. Uh, he's got the kind of haircut that a youthful man would have. Um, so it shows him as Mary, um, as a teenager, basically. When you get into his hand, if I had told you that this was a picture of a real hand, I don't think you would doubt me. Um, he even has like the little folds of skin uh, when your hand moves and the way that the flesh is displaced and when it's resting on something. So his study of anatomy was really useful in this way. And then you can see how Mary, when she presses into Jesus, um, his flesh is displaced and the cloak that she's using to hold him with is displaced as well. Uh, so all of these minor details, part of it is Michelangelo showing off, but it's also uh, an incredible way to um, to rate realism. So this is probably his most famous sculpture. Uh, it's his sculpture of David. And we had seen a David theme already. This one is quite different. Um, so he returns to Florence in about 1501. And this particular block of marble uh, was so huge and amazing uh, that it had a name. It was called the giant. And another artist tried to make something out of it and was like, I can't do it. It's too much for me. Uh, and Michelangelo's like, I'll get right in there. Uh, and he's still only 26 years old when he gets a commission. Uh, and it was commissioned to join Donatello's David in the Palazzo della Signora. So uh, perhaps a way to show uh, a different way of showing David. So in this one, David looks like a full-grown man. Uh, he's not the teenager that we saw from Donatello. Uh, we can tell from the broadness of his shoulders and uh, his face. Uh, he looks like a more grown up man. It used to be when I took classes like this that they said that David was 14 feet, thir three inches high. And you think that would be easy to just, you know, measure it. Um, but people hadn't. Somebody had measured it a long time ago and something happened in the translation and <laughs> all the books had 14 feet, three inches until the early 2000s uh, where the people of the Digital Michelangelo Project they wanted to make a three-dimensional laser scan of this so that they could use this new technology of 3D printing uh, to be able to create um, sculpture so that people could study it in detail. Um, so uh, that's something that's pretty common today. At the time, it was like kind of high technology. So they came up with all this like super expensive gear to try to scan it. And they, they looked at the books and it said it's 14 feet. So they got this rig and it was 
15 feet high and then they put it up to the sculpture and it's like a couple feet short. So they get the lowest piece of technology there, a tape measure, get up on a ladder and they measure it and they find out 17 feet. They come back later with a better rig uh, and they make the, um, they make the scan. Uh, they originally had it available. I'll put the link up, uh, the scan. So if you have access to like 3D printing, um, you'll be able to make your own little David, uh, or maybe bigger if you can have access to a pretty big one. So a couple of things are going on about modified proportions in this one. Um, so the first thing you kind of notice is that he's got huge hands, or maybe you notice something else wasn't so huge at first. Um, and his head is really large as well. And even when you see it from the ground level, it still looks that way. He has big old hands uh, and a big head. Uh, so some of the ideas with uh, why he would be shown in that way, and his head looks really large in this one, is because of the story of David and the way that Christians thought of it. Um, and that David, uh, he wasn't a winner uh, against Goliath because he was particularly talented or skilled or something like that. Um, instead, he had power that came from God. Uh, and people at this time, they looked at human consciousness as a power that came from God. So how do you illustrate that? You make a big old head. Uh, and Michelangelo is actually making a statement that's a little bit different than what most people would think. Uh, because he's basically locating the soul, which some people at this time saw as synonymous with the mind, uh, in the head instead of the heart, which was kind of the official statement of uh, the Catholic Church at the time. So that'll come up a little bit later on because he may have tried to hide some, some of those types of messages. But he also has big hands. So like we saw with the Mona Lisa, someone has hands that shows they're doing something. Uh, so he has this mind, the spiritual power, uh, but he also has these hands that enabled him to make the spiritual power happen in the real world. So it's like Michelangelo himself. He's the artist. Uh, he has the mind and he creates it um, in the world. And he doesn't feel like he has to be limited by like normal proportions for hands or, or heads because they tell the story. Um, so we see him from the back. Uh, he looks pretty determined in this one. You can kind of see how his brow is furrowed and his mouth is kind of firm uh, and it looks like he's flexing everywhere. <laughs> um, but some angles you see his face from, it doesn't look so much. So this one, uh, we see another interesting thing that they show about David because uh, David is um, in ancient Hebrew and at that time, all ancient Hebrews were circumcised. Uh, but by this time in 16th century Italy, uh, Italians didn't circumcise themselves, but this dude is definitely not circumcised. Uh, so he's kind of showing him as not Jewish in a way, uh, but also probably because his model uh, that he used um, was most likely uncircumcised. You may know sometimes people say, well, why do they, they make their packages so small? Uh, part of the reason why is because they don't want to make the figure look too sexual. So they kind of like downplay it. It's not because like Italian men in the 16th century were all um, pack and light or something like that. Uh, but in this close up, you can see how much detail he puts into it. The veins, uh, all the muscles and bones that are underneath. And as the figure is kind of leaning to one side and moving his hand, uh, all of those things um, move in concert with each other. The body is like a machine. Um, but when you get in close with his face, yeah, he could look determined but he also looks worried like this furrowing instead of you know looking like determination like it did before uh, and we see it from this angle it looks more like worry uh, and that would kind of make sense with the story because even though uh, he might feel like he has the grace of God uh, there might be some doubt uh, and Christians at this time are all about expressing um, doubt and miracles uh, so in this photo I think he looks even more uh, we can see the concern on his face. He's very worried, which would be totally understandable for uh, a person in this particular situation. Uh, it's a beautiful picture. I don't know how somebody took it. Uh, so again, we can see the veins sticking out. Um, and if you look at the hands, and we'll get in a little closer, we can see those are not like somebody sitting down and chilling hands. Those are the types of hands that Michelangelo would have. In other words, the types of hands where somebody is 
hacking into stone all of their life. Uh, this is a working person's hands uh, with these knobby knuckles uh, and all of this like imperfections in the hands. This is not like an elite person's hands, but that kind of expresses that this spiritual power that he had, he still had to put through a physical uh, and a very difficult physical um, exertion.